In 4.3, we'll be looking at aquatic food production systems, and this is our source of seafood. Um, sometimes we use uh, fisheries in the open ocean, sometimes we use aquaculture to help increase our food production. So we're going to be looking at all of these different methods in this module. All right, so before we get into the fishing methods, we need an understanding of food webs in marine ecosystems. So our producers in the marine food web are phytoplankton. Uh, and they're going to support many different food webs throughout the ocean depending on the location. If you look in the map at the bottom right hand corner, this shows where the highest rates of productivity are in the oceans. And if you'll notice, the most highly productive areas are around the shorelines or in shallow seas. And the reason for this is because of nutrient upwelling. Um, and we'll talk about what upwelling is. So upwelling is when those cold nutrient rich waters come up from the ocean depths. Um, usually, um, the limiting factor for shallow areas are nutrients because you're going to get plenty of sunlight. So we need the nutrients that have sunk to the bottom of the ocean floor because usually when organisms die, their remains sink. Um, so if you look in the animation down here, um, when the surface water moves offshore, um, it's replaced by the colder bottom water that rises. And when that cold water rises, it brings nutrients with it. So you can see here, once again, in the map, the areas where upwellings occur along coastlines are areas that are the most productive. Now, one of the factors that affects upwelling um, in the Southern Pacific Ocean is El Nino Southern o Oscillation, or ENSO events. They occur every few years. Um, but normally what happens is the prevailing westerlies, um, which are winds that push water along the um, surface of the ocean from South America um, to Southeast Asia, normally that warm water brings mon seasonal monsoons, which are rainstorms that provide the water that's needed. However, when the winds weaken, that warm water stays along the coast of South America. Then the monsoons fall somewhere in the middle of the ocean. And when that warm water stays along the coast, then the upwellings are repressed or suppressed. And when that happens, the fishing industry actually suffers because if there's no nutrients for the fish, the fish are going to go elsewhere. Um, so fisheries are areas where we harvest fish. 90% of those um, are in the oceans. The other 10% are in freshwater. Um, some of these are wild fisheries. Some of them are aquaculture where we're raising fish. More than 70% of our natural fisheries in the oceans are fully exploited, which means that the numbers are either in steep decline or are already too low for the fish numbers to recover. And the demand is high for fish and it's rising. Fish is high in protein and low in saturated fats. It also contains vitamins A, B, and D that are necessary for a healthy diet. And one of the things that we've seen in our more economically developed countries are that um, individuals are becoming more health conscious. So diets are including more and more fish because it's a healthy way to get protein as compared to beef. And if you see in the um, graph here at the bottom right shows the world food production of beef compared to farmed fish. And fish has actually risen um, up to where levels of beef are. All right, so there's different methods to fishing. Um, there's been changes in fishing equipment, changing to fishing methods that have caused our fish stocks to drop and also damage to habitats. And harvesting of some species, like seals and whales, has become controversial. There are ethical issues over bio rights, um, the rights of indigenous cultures, who's part of their culture to um, hunt whales. And also there's been international conservation legislation that affects what we can and cannot catch. Um, so my intent was, as I showed you these different fishing methods, this little black box here in the corner was supposed to be a video. Um, so I've also attached the PowerPoint um, to the module so you can go through and see what each of these methods look like. 
Um, but dredging are metal frame baskets that are dragged across the seafloor, so you can imagine the damage that they cause to that seafloor habitat. Um, we use these to collect shellfish, like oysters and clams, things that attach to the bottom. Um, and so in order to lift these organisms that are attached, the metal teeth dig into the seafloor. If we are impacting the seafloor habitat, then that greatly reduces the number of bottom-dwelling species. So this is um, an unsustainable method. Okay. The next type are gill nets, uh, which use currents of nets. Once again, go back and um, check out these videos in the PowerPoint so you can see what the methods look like. Um, but it's nets that are suspended. Um, sometimes they're anchored to the seafloor. Sometimes they float at the surface. Uh, but fish swim right in. They can't see the nets. Um, so we catch huge schools of fish, but also can accidentally um, capture what we call bycatch, which are unintended um, animals like sharks and sea turtles, or dolphins in the case of tuna. Trawling is when we pull nets uh, behind a boat along the seafloor. Um, these are also used to catch um, bottom-dwelling fish similar to dredging. Um, these are also uh, known for catching bycatch or organisms that are unintended and a lot of those are thrown back, either dead or end up dying. Um, this is very similar to dredging in that can it damage the sensitive seafloor habitats. Long lining is using fishing lines behind the boats. They can be anywhere from 1 to 50 miles long that contain baited hooks. Um, a lot of times they're near the surface and they can catch fish like tuna or swordfish or they can be used for the deeper dwelling fish like cod and halibut. Um, but the lines can also um, hook other species that are attracted to the bait that are unintended catch. Now when we are controlling um, or setting yields for the amount of fish that can be caught, uh, we use the term maximum sustainable yield and that is the highest amount that can be taken without permanently depleting the stock. So we have to figure out how many fish and what size fish can be taken so that you're not impacting the harvest in future years. Generally, the maximum sustainable yield is about half of the carrying capacity. And usually fishing quotas, they will set slightly below that just to make sure um, that we will have a stock to catch from the following year. Some of the strategies that we can follow to avoid unsustainable fishing in addition to setting quotas, um, there can be legislation at international, national, local levels, um, but ultimately at the individual level we have to change human behavior. Um, some things that have been done, improving boats and fishing gear, um, using satellites to detect boats to help um, um, enforce some of the legislation, um, designating marine protected areas and also restricting the type of fishing gear such as the mesh on nets which can help cut down on the amount of bycatch. Um, and then we've also moved to using aquaculture which is providing food resources um, outside of our ocean fisheries or our national natural fisheries and this method is expected to continue to rise as well. So advantages of aquaculture, it does account for over 50% of the world market for fish right now. So that takes the stress off of ocean fisheries. It is becoming more sustainable and it is an efficient means of protein production when you compare it to beef production or our terrestrial livestock. However, there are disadvantages, um, loss of habitats, and there's a lot of pollution. The feed that we give the fish, antibiotics and other medicine that are added to the pens that get out into the open ocean. Um, disease is spread very quickly because the fish are crammed into small spaces. Um, and also if the uh, fish that are being farmed escape, a lot of times these are genetically modified and they breed with the natural fish which, which can create problems in the open ocean. There's several different types of aquaculture. One is a hatchery where the fish are bred and reared in nurseries. Um, sometimes they are um, kept in the nurseries until it's time to harvest them. Sometimes they are released into the wild capture fisheries. Um, 
When they are released, they do compete with the wild populations for food, which can be an issue. And as I said before, if they're genetically modified, they can interbreed. And any time that you have genetically modified the interbreed, then that can decrease um, the genetic diversity of the gene pool. And so that can threaten the viability of these wild populations. A second method um, is an open net pen or cage which encloses the fish offshore. Um, so it keeps them in an open body of water, but what happens is the waste from the fish still um, are passed to the wild habitat and they can also escape their pens and disrupt the wild populations. Ponds are used um, in coastal areas or inland areas usually for shrimp, catfish, and tilapia. Um, the wastewater can be contained and treated, however, um, the untreated wastewater can pollute the surrounding environment and even seep into the groundwater, which has created problems. A lot of the shrimp ponds have been um, constructed in what used to be mangrove forests, and we have lost 3.7 million acres of this important coastal habitat. I can get my, there we go. A uh, recirculating system is another method um, using fish in tanks um, that are raised in these systems until they are um, harvested. They cannot escape, but um, it is very expensive and it relies on electricity or other power systems. Um, one sustainable method is um, one of the ways that China produces fish, and China actually uh, produces 62% of all farmed fish worldwide, and this is not the only method of aquaculture, um, but what they've been doing is raising carp and catfish in rice paddies. So the waste from the fish actually provides fertilizer for the rice, um, and this is one sustainable way of raising these fish. There's been international conflict over fishing. The Cod Wars were di disputes between Britain and Iceland between the 1950s and 70s. Um, there was a halibut war between Canada and Spain in 1995 um, that actually became violent. Um, more recently, growing tensions between India and Sri Lanka. Um, 100 Indian fishermen were killed and 350 seriously injured uh, as they were fishing along the Sri Lankan coast. Um, and then this year, China's increased their fishing fleet to over 2,000%. Um, and in the past, in actually the past 10 years, they've had conflict um, over where they are fishing, if they're fishing in waters that belong to other countries. Um, and we saw some of the issues with water wars in the video we watched in the last class over drinking water and usable water. But there are many conflicts over the water as a food production method system as well. All right, so as I said before, go back and open up the PowerPoint and take a look at the videos that are embedded so you can see what some of these um, fishing methods and aquaculture methods look like.